because this is um, one of the worst public health crises that we have seen. Um, and I'm getting kind of old, so in my lifetime, but even people older than me uh, have said, um, and I think that things like the HIV crisis, those of us who've been affected by uh, systemic racism, there are you know, a lot of things going on, but this is one in which uh, we have had the opportunity to, to put off. Other countries have not been uh, as negatively affected as we have, and we actually have the capacity to stop this thing in its tracks. Uh, and much of why we're suffering today disproportionately, especially as, as Black Americans, um, is not so much to do with anything uh, about our, our Black skin in terms of biology, but it's about policies and decisions uh, that have been made about resource allocation. So I'm going to spend some time. Uh, can I share my slides? Yeah, uh, let me just. Uh, yes, please. Uh, please go ahead. Go ahead and start sharing. Can I start sharing? Here? here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm going to go to presentation mode. Can you guys see this? Yes, you just need to. Okay. So I'm going to spend some time talking about. <clears throat> Uh, you know, vaccine equity uh, in general, but it's it's going to be policy focused, going to be resource focused. You know, Dr. Young gave a very important context that I, that I don't think that we should uh, forget. Uh, and that when we talk about health policy, policies are decisions. They're plans, decisions, and actions. And the world health definition of health policy is plans, decisions, and actions that affect the health of, of, of a community. Um, and there were several plans, decisions, and actions that really resulted in what we see uh, today. Now, this is an older slide. Uh, I think this is uh, probably as of January or so. Um, you access February 2021. But what it shows us is the death rate, uh, the hospitalization rate, and the case rate. Because if you can, you guys see my arrow, Sharon, when I point on this thing. Yes, we can. Okay, so so this is the number of cases of COVID nineteen uh, in the United States by race, ethnicity, and if we look at this third column of data right here, African Americans compared to whites roughly had almost the same amount of cases, one point one, uh, but African Americans compared to whites had three times as many hospitalizations and twice as many deaths. So for every one uh, white person that died, two black people died. Very similar numbers for African, uh, for our Hispanic and Latinx brothers and sisters, as well as uh, the American Indian population. Uh, and don't be fooled by this Asian, uh, non Hispanic persons. You know, they lump Asians uh, together in, in all categories. Uh, and there's a lot of disparity, especially in the Asian Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian communities, in which their death rate and hospitalization rate uh, is very similar to those of other Black and Brown communities. Uh, however, um, as we've seen in the events of the past week, uh, uh, Asian members of our society are victims of racism, uh, just like many of us are in many respects, and it's actually gotten worse in the past year. Uh, and, you know, when people make jokes about this being the China flu, and we had leadership before that disregarded the impact of, of hateful words, uh, we have now seen an increase in, in, in attacks against that community. So, so you know, th those words and those concerns about racism, we have to take that seriously. This is the death rate uh, for COVID-19 in Los Angeles. And what this uh, shows, this is a, a, a use of something called an adjusted rate. And so when we look at a number that we want to use the same number to compare death rates for uh, populations or groups that may have different numbers of people in a society, we'll adjust a death rate so that we can use that same number. So these are the numbers of deaths for every 100,000 people, okay, in Los Angeles County. So for every 100,000 Blacks, uh, we've had 185 deaths from COVID-19 uh, compared to 117 for whites. Uh, and if you look at this number for the Latinx community, uh, excuse me, uh, that number is even, uh, even higher, um, almost three times the death rate for Latinx uh, compared to whites. And ours is, is approaching too as well. So that death rate we've seen nationally, we've also seen in Los Angeles. But uh, I want us to be clear on this um, because you know we talked about the case rate being different, but our death rate, although you've heard about higher death rates for, due to obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and, and, and other reasons, 
uh, what you must understand is that when we get the same care, we actually have the same outcomes. This is a study by one of my colleagues at NYU who looked at black and white differences in death from COVID-19 and people who were hospitalized. Um, and when you look at people who actually get into hospital care, the black white differences go away. You know, really showing us that it's the structural determinants pervasive in black and Hispanic communities, that structural racism, which how we decide where uh, resources are allocated that play a very large role. This is a map of Los Angeles. I don't have to hopefully give you all the history, but we know that uh, you know, in the 1960s, we had a rebellion here and that rebellion was because there was no resources. There was a policy decision to have a commission, the McCone Commission to look into the health status or to look into the reasons of the riot uh, and, the, uh, and the uprising. And uh, they found that, you know, people in South Los Angeles were not getting health care. Uh, and one of the things they did was make the decision to start, which now became Charles R. Drew University of Medicine Science, uh, as well as the hospital that was uh, right next to our campus in this circle, this green area, is South Los Angeles, okay? Um, these dots are hospitals. So when we talk about access to hospital care, okay, um, it's very clear that there is a lack of hospitals in South LA. Those of you who know that this hospital that was here in 2000 was a large Martin Luther King Community Hospital closed in 2007. And so at that time, this green area, this community of South Los Angeles uh, had no hospital. So 1 million people there, okay? Now, fortunately, the hospital opened up as a community hospital uh, <clears throat> and uh, that uh, gave us a hospital back right across the street from our campus, but it opened up at about a third of the size with 130 beds and 10 ICU beds, okay? For a community of a million people. And so that at the peak, of the pandemic, you know, the crush on that hospital system uh, was, was uh, devastating. And they had to double up their ICU beds with 20 ICU beds for a community of a million people when they're disproportionately affected by COVID really led to a lot of uh, the disparities and deaths uh, that we saw that were unnecessary. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this slide, but it does go through some of the differences between South LA in this first column, Los Angeles County and the nation. And just to let you know that South LA, you know, 30% of South LA roughly is African-American, 90% uh, is black and Latinx when you combine it, 20% uh, had no health insurance, but one third of the people described difficulty accessing medical care. The healthcare resource map, you know, is, is clear on that. Uh, the disparities in uh, preventable and cardiovascular disease uh, is also higher in South, in South Los Angeles compared to the others. I know part of the focus of this program is to think about chronic disease. And so uh, those of us in South LA um, <clears throat> uh, and, and those who care for folks in South LA uh, are dealing with those disparities. Th this map is one in which I just wanna highlight these two red circles here, okay? Because this is uh, data from back in January 20. 21, when I looked at how many people died uh, in Watts compared to those in Westwood. Um, and during the time that they reported the COVID-19 deaths of the public health department, the death rate in Watts from COVID was eight times higher than the death rate in Westwood, okay? Up here where UCLA is versus down here, right north of Martin Luther King Hospital. So sure, there was a national two to one death rate, but locally we had an eight to one death rate in the community right next to our campus from COVID-19. Uh, but when I show you those, those, those you know, disparities in, in terms of resource allocation, this is not surprising, okay? This map shows you the density of cases. Um, and so the darker areas show you where the zip codes have more COVID cases. And you can see in South LA, there were more COVID cases uh, compared to other parts. And I use that as the backdrop because this is the most recent data on vaccination. Okay, so this color-coded chart, the lighter areas show you where less than 45% of the people have been vaccinated, okay? The darker areas show you where that more than 66% of the people have been vaccinated. And so what you can see here in this map is that South Los Angeles is a region in which we are falling behind or have not caught up 
or may not have had the resources to get these vaccines. But it matches the other disparities in healthcare resources that we just showed. It overlays the disparities that we've seen in terms of the worst health outcomes. Uh, when we look at those who are most at risk, those over 65, and, and those of you who have known, you know, those over 65 were, you know, uh, uh, ahead of many others in line because uh, those over 65 were at a greater risk of dying. But even if we look at those who are over 65 who could have been vaccinated almost over a month ago now, um, we've opened these vaccines up to so many other folks, uh, you know, people who are uh, educators and people who are in uh, central workforce conditions. And those are all good, but most, most of those people are younger and healthier and a, and a lower the risk for dying. They're at a higher risk for getting infected, but a lower risk for dying. We still haven't gotten more than half of our seniors in South LA vaccinated yet. I showed you the resources in terms of healthcare, but this actually, this map doesn't look too bad. This map has uh, got a lot of resources. Actually, these red dots are the number of churches that uh, our friends and colleagues at Charles Drew identified who were willing to host vaccine sites. And so one of the things that we can do, uh, those of you in the faith-based community, uh, have an opportunity to change this. And so we've been having conversations and those of you who've been joining us in that effort uh, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health has agreed to send vaccination teams to the churches and do these vaccines in the churches. So where there may not be resources uh, for uh, vaccinations through the hospitals, the churches can step in and in partnership with the county, we can hopefully address that. These are where the county are currently having vaccine sites. Uh, but if you notice here, especially this lower part of South LA, and I'll try to blow it up, there aren't as many sites. And although there are at federally qualified health centers, not all health centers are, uh, are doing vaccinations. Uh, and so there are resources, but there are still gaps. And even if they are filled, the disparity in actually getting those vaccines allocated that I showed you in those earlier maps suggests that something else needs to be done. Uh, and so something else that can be done is to have uh, an educated and informed faith-based community uh, that has the willingness to step in where we haven't been able to and to make sure we provide them with the resources. Now, when we look at vaccination allocation by race, ethnicity, this is data from the Kaiser Family Foundation. And what they show is that, uh, uh, and this is as of this week, uh, <clears throat> the rate of vaccination of Black people in, in California is about 3%. And we are roughly five to 6% of the population. I, the, I looked this up because this 5% looked low. Uh, uh, California's actually about six and a half percent African-American. And so we have less than half of uh, African-Americans in this state vaccinated as well. Very similar to what we saw uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the uh, 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 county uh, level data. Whereas white uh, folks in California are, are pretty much even in terms of their percent population, 36% of the population, and they're about 35% of those who've been vaccinated now. So they're almost equal. We're still at about half. Um, <clears throat> younger uh, folks in Los Angeles County, um, only about 5% of everybody 16 and over in Los Angeles County has been vaccinated. 17% of Asians, 24% of Latinx, and 30% of whites. Now, there is some disproportionate levels here because we've been vaccinating people based upon being healthcare providers and things of that sort. But when we look at 65 and over, okay, we still uh, are not getting our Black community vaccinated as much as we really need to. And so this is the data as of Oh, to today, I think they, they release this data every two weeks. So I think this is last week. Um, as you can see here, the percentage of people over 65 in each group that have been vaccinated, 50% uh, of Asians have been vaccinated, but only 38% of African-Americans, 43% of Latinx, and 56% of whites. So we still have a way to go, even just to get to the halfway point. And I want you guys to remember that number of 38 uh, percent, because that's going to be uh, important. Uh, not only are we not at the halfway mark, but at 38 percent of African Americans over 65 being vaccinated, um, we're going to revisit that when we talk about this. Some people were talking about hesitancy, 
And we get really mad when we talk about hesitancy in the sense that sometimes people use hesitancy as an excuse to say that's why black people aren't getting vaccinated. So there are some truths. I think, you know, Professor Davis showed us a lot of information about why uh, we have reason to be cautious and to be vigilant in terms of how uh, African Americans are treated in health systems and in research. Uh, and so the reason to be hesitant uh, or be cautious may be well founded, but hesitancy in terms of the likelihood to get the vaccine and saying, I won't get the vaccine um, is higher in African Americans and other groups. But if we look at this, this is national data published as of January. This number here is 66% of African Americans said they will get it. Okay, now to get herd immunity through vaccination, we need to have 70, 80% of the population vaccinated. So although African Americans are 34% not likely or definitely not likely to get it in that hesitant group, 66% of us will get it. So yes, we're more hesitant than others, but we're not so hesitant that we wouldn't get it. And we're not so hesitant that we should only have 38% of folks in Los Angeles vaccinated when potentially 66% of uh, folks uh, would be likely or somewhat likely to get it. Now, this is national data, and I'm going to just show one more slide. And I know uh, some folks kind of get on me with these data slides because they get kind of confusing. But from the research side, um, when we do research and we look at groups that are more likely or less likely to do something, we'll do something called a regression model, and we'll do analyses to account for other factors. And when we account for other factors that might cause people to be hesitant, there actually is no statistical difference in uh, uh, who is uh, hesitant to get vaccinated. Uh, and this is this top bar here, okay? So basically, it just shows you that there's no statistical difference in terms of the racial and ethnic group's hesitancy over vaccine when you adjust your analysis for all these other things. And some of those other things are, you know, are you concerned or not concerned about getting infected? Uh, do you perceive whether or not you're going to get infected? Uh, and so when you look at people who feel like they have no risk, those folks are more likely to be hesitant or refuse the vaccine. Um, there's data today that just shows that, you know, if you look at the most hesitant or reluctant group in this country uh, to not want to get the vaccine, it's not African-Americans, it's white Republicans. 40, over 49% of white Republicans uh, refuse or will not get the vaccine. Um, how am I doing on time, Dr. Kam? I see you coming back on. You're fine. You still have about 10 more minutes at least. Perfect. Okay, so we'll have some time for questions as well. I'm going to show you a few more slides here. This is data from last year that just looks at this question about whether people will or will not get the vaccine. And I think what's important about this is not so much what these numbers are where African Americans are less likely to get vaccinated compared to other groups because that difference is true. But what I want you also to see is that this number is going up and down, okay? Um, and so that, you know, the data I showed you before from that national data, which is much more recent, suggests that 66% of African-Americans currently will actually get it. So the likelihood of this data from October 2020 is probably up here compared to the study I just showed you, okay? So that this is not static, it's fluid. And this really highlights the importance of why having health advocates and having you as our trusted leaders and having you as the people of the black community, you know, I, I, you know we, we say this a lot, outside of maybe the barber and the undertaker, the ministers are one of our few members in the black community for whom you are only and wholly responsible to us and your community. Okay, the elected officials are out there, but they have to run for election, they have to get money. And I'm not throwing shade on politicians, but they have a lot of external influences that they have to respond to. But in terms of people who lead our community, who only have to respond to our community uh, and who are accountable to our community wholeheartedly, there are very few professions and leaders that are out there. So that's why I feel it's so important for us as academics and researchers to provide you with the appropriate knowledge uh, and evidence so that you can share that with our community because that's about trust, okay? And so they may have a lot of other reasons to mistrust people who are getting funds from other sources or who may not actually show up or who may not be there when they need them. 
but I want to make sure that you know we give you guys the the best information we can because we know that uh, you're in a position to pass on a message to people who uh, who, who trust you and have good reason to. Uh, this just uh, shows uh, some data from last year about overall in LA County uh, the likelihood, and, and it was going down like I showed you before. But uh, it's just a, a slide I showed to say that this aspect of hesitancy does change. This is the best data that I have available on hesitancy by race ethnicity in Los Angeles County. Uh, and this is also old data. So if you look at it, yes, African-Americans, which is this third bar towards the last column here, when we look at race ethnicity, uh, as of last year, December, 50% of African-Americans said they would get it. And roughly about 25% of African-Americans said that uh, they were hesitant but if we got those who were hesitant to agree to do it, you know, we'd be at that 75%. Um, and if I trust the data that was published in January, I think that we're getting closer to that. So if 50% of people in Los Angeles that are African-American said they would get the vaccine, and we only have 38% of African-Americans in Los Angeles vaccinated, what's going on? Okay. But hopefully what I've shown you is that resource allocation, putting vaccines in the communities where they need it. I think what Dr. Young and Dr. Santana didn't talk about was that, you know, when you need to get a vaccine, and many of you may have seen this, when they first rolled out the allocation policy, they said you had to get online, register on my turn, and then get to one of those centers. If you don't have internet, if you don't have the patience, if you don't have the skill, uh, many of our, our community members couldn't even get on my turn. Most folks who I knew who were older got registered by their grandkids. Um, or by somebody else who had the time and the wherewithal to sit online and keep hitting that button until you got an appointment. So, so some of those barriers are coming down. Uh, for those of you who are part of the faith-based vaccination effort, um, we now have the capacity to have churches develop their own registration list so that when the county comes to vaccinate at your church, the people on your list will be able to show up at your church and get the full registration on the day of vaccine. Okay, so, so there are things that are being done to try to help with these structural issues. Um, I'm just going to briefly end on a quick overview of policy because I want people to understand how this works. So uh, at the federal government level, there's something called the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. They made the recommendations on uh, how we should roll out these vaccines, okay? It's an external body separate from the CDC, separate from the actual federal government, and they have uh, African-American physicians and researchers that come in. They were the group that decided that older folks who were living in long-term care facilities and doctors should come first, then those over 65, then those over, uh, between 16 and 65 with medical conditions, and those who are doing essential work. Uh, so so that, that decision was made based upon trying to ensure that people who were at greatest risk of getting it, like healthcare personnel, or those dying from it, like long-term care facility residents, were first in line. Today, we are really at 1C. Um, so this, everybody in these first uh, three groups are currently actually eligible for vaccination, okay? And so in the country, okay, you know, these other three groups, once we get past everybody over 60, that's 81 million and another 20 million that have now come into the pool nationally to get these vaccines with the potential to crowd out those of us uh, who, uh, those uh, among us who are over 65. Um, these decisions about who now sends vaccines to where is another thing that I want you to be aware of because uh, as faith-based leaders and as community leaders, oftentimes the politicians listen to you, but you also have to know what uh, politicians are making the decisions about the health of our community. So once the federal government decides uh, on the allocation practice, the actual decision of where vaccines go and how do vaccines come into Los Angeles happen at the federal, state, and local level. I'm going to focus on the last bar here for each one. Uh-oh. I'm going to focus on uh, this last line here. This is my last slide, Dr. Kahn. I'm going to focus on this last bullet here, uh, allocation. Okay, and that just says who decides where the vaccines go and who's deciding how many vaccines come into Los Angeles. The federal government through the Federal Emergency Management Agency sends vaccines into Los Angeles. 
Uh, they send them through uh, the Office of Emergency Services in coordination with the governor's office and the National Guard. They also send vaccines into Los Angeles County through the large resale pharmacies. So the Walgreens and the CVS are getting their vaccines directly from the federal government. And then federally qualified community health centers and the VA system also get their vaccines directly from the feds. The state gets uh, uh, allocation from the federal government and then the state of California and the governor's office through the California Department of Public Health, then decide how those state level vaccines get distributed. They've currently decided to send them out to the local health districts like the health departments and the multi-county entities, which are the large multi-county uh, hospitals like UCLA and Kaiser's. Uh, and they've now brought in somebody uh, to be a third party administrator called the Blue Shield uh, Corporation, which is a, a is a health plan to help them manage this uh, this system. And the details of how this is going to work um, is not entirely clear to everybody because everybody has to now negotiate with this entity. But currently, they're coming from the state allocation to the local county health department and to the multi-county entities. And then the local county health department down here is the entity that's actually doing some of the more lower level distribution to our churches, to the health centers, to the, me to the megapods, and to the hospitals that are just within the county. So the folks who actually control this allocation of what comes into the uh, county of Los Angeles include uh, the federal government uh, at health and human services level, but you can get your Congress people and your senators to ensure that your community is getting the, the proper allocations that come in through the feds. At the state level, the governor's office, and you can make sure that your state representatives and the governor's, governor's office make sure that your community get the proper allocations. And then at the local health department, which is the Department of Public Health, which uh, must uh, respond to the directives of your board of supervisors. So I hope that I've given you some overview of some of the disparities um, some of the challenges to health equity, uh, but moreover, some of the potential solutions and to give you information about how these decisions are made for our community. And I, and I want to thank you guys. Uh, this is a, uh, you know, it, it's a long uh, uh, set of lectures to sit through. Um, and, and the fact that you've decided to, to sit through these lectures uh, and, and hear this information, um, I just want to commend you and I want to thank you. Uh, thank you for your time and for your interest.